This evening, our primary concern will be a consideration of the solar system as it has descended to us in the spiritual, spiritual traditions of the great religions and philosophies of the world. The solar system has always been at least partly comprehensible. Peoples of different times have interpreted the mystery of it according to their own degree of insight. But certain astronomical phenomena were discovered at a comparatively early date. And while it was not until a few hundred years ago that our present astronomical pattern came into general acceptance, there is no doubt that ancient man intuited a great deal of what we call the modern science of astronomy. He probably could not pass a test according to our present standards, but he may also have possessed what modern astronomers do not have, and that is the inward experience of a living universe. Uh, to most modern people, even though they may actually deny the literalness of the statement, to most of them, the solar system in which we live is at best only an environment. It is a place larger than the back 40 acres of 19th century agriculturists, but still a place. It was merely an area in which things could happen. And whatever things were likely to happen were associated with planets, luminaries, asteroids perhaps, meteors, and finally the sovereign leadership of the sun. The solar system was a wonderful, magnificent kind of machine. Where it came from, we could abstractly speculate that it must ultimately be dissolved in some final combustion we can also assume. There is also a parallel line of thought in which it is going to become colder and colder until it becomes impossible to exist within it. All these uh, rather melancholy concepts, however, are separated from our present thought by countless millennia yet to come. These things are for the remote future. The solar system as we see it is therefore our house. And from a very early time, men began to think of it as a temple, a tabernacle, a shrine. Pythagoras referred to the sun as a flaming altar around which the chariots of the gods were driven in their orbits, what we would call planets. The early church was not so very different in its speculations on these matters. At some comparatively ancient time, man also sensed that there was more to planets than he had first imagined the belief that they were some kind of deities he held even anciently. They were sparks of light in the sky and observations from the great astronomical towers or ziggurats on the plains of Babylon revealed that planets moved more rapidly than stars. So to them was given the term the wanderers. They moved in some remarkable procession around the sovereignty of the sun. This was not entirely understood, but they did move, and they had orbits. And even several thousand years ago, men calculated these orbits with some accuracy. Probably at first, the most practical purpose was 
divination. Astrology, sometimes called the mad mother of astronomy, had come into being. Almost equally useful was the development of an accurate calendar. Men liked to know how to record the seasons and time and finally durations of ages. Not only was the calendar highly advanced in Asia and the Mediterranean area, but it was well advanced on the Western Hemisphere, especially in Central America. When the Spaniards came here, they corrected their own calendar from the calendar of the Maya. Thus, astronomy was always a more or less sacred science. It was part of the priestly prerogative, and all priests were supposed to know about the motions of the stars and to be able to predict the changes of seasons, and in Egypt, the inundations of the Nile. The solar system also began to intrigue another type of thinker, the analogist. And nearly all ancient science was analogical. Uh, the scientists sought to establish parallels between simple things easily known and more difficult things which are hard to understand. And he began to think of the solar system as a living body. He began to think of it as some kind of an organic structure. And he sought to find parallels in the physical body of man, some way of creating a key to the interpretation of universals from man or perhaps a key to understanding man from a study of universals. This particular aspect was rather highly advanced by the old Kabbalists, and their findings descended as part of the heritage of early Christian mysticism. The Kabbalists, we may say, devised the concept that the solar system was a great person, a macrocosmic being, and that this uh, great person, who was called Macroprosophus, was an organic living thing. That the planets represented the organs within the living body of this power. The sun was the heart. Uh, this body was also composed of flesh and of bones. Not only were, this, were these flesh and bones taken from the physical structures of planets, the rock was bone, the flesh was herbage and vegetation. But it was also believed that an arterial circulation existed within the body of this greater being. Energy moved in courses like great streams descending from the sun. Energy did not simply dissipate itself in an infinite diffusion. It was actually uh, distributed by some kind of a mysterious arterial or venous system. And in order to provide some kind of an attenuated substance in which this energy might flow without being dissipated, our ancient brethren developed the concept of ether as an invisible element, as a hypothetical medium by means of which uh, forces and energies otherwise irreconcilable could be brought together in a common state or condition. To the alchemists, the solar system was a kind of tree which grew up, and the planets became the symbols of the sacred metals and the various chemicals used in the preparation of the wise man's stone. The planets were also elements of a great theory of medicine in China. In India also, the planets and their orbits provided the key for music and the, and the musical modes. And nearly all Chinese and other oriental instruments are arranged according to a concept of planetary interrelationships. Pythagoras had the same concept when he broke the monochord or the single string with frets 
and arranged these frets according to the old concept of the planetary orbits. In all, the solar system became a kind of general source of analogical knowledge. Today we are inclined to think that this is all more or less a superstition. Uh, we are loath to admit that we might be living within a vast cellular organism. But the more we study cells and molecules and atoms and electrons and ions, uh, the more it becomes evident that there are analogies between the solar system and the minute structures which make up the mass of matter as we know it today. We are also becoming more aware of the fact that there is no such a thing as any inert substance. Everything is living material, made up of life, and therefore it would hardly be proper to think of the solar system anymore as dead. It would be better to think of it as a vast area of life, uh, perhaps an area of seminal life, that is, life in the form of seed life, uh, which could, under certain conditions, unfold its own potential, and from each seed might spring another solar system in the course of infinite ages. The Hindus, of course, did not like to think of a solar system wandering around lonely in space, so it proceeded uh, the Hindu proceeded to populate space with an innumerable family of such solar systems. They might differ in detail, they might vary in size, but they were a kind of creation, just as man is a kind of creation. And as this type of creation may have many subtypes, so in the solar system pattern, there could be many different solar systems. And as the sun ruled in sovereignty over its planets, so it was assumed that a certain number of solar systems formed also a pattern, and that in the midst of these was a larger or universal sun around which many solar systems moved. Uh, these solar systems uh, moving around this sovereign sun uh, also constituted units. Therefore, a cosmic system was merely a larger type of cell with suns taking the place of planets and each sun surrounded by its own worlds. All these universal systems also grouped around greater centers, which might be likened uh, to cosmic suns. And these also, in their endless movements in space, arrange themselves in vast patterns around still more remote centers of life and energy, until the universe and all that it contained and the vast field of space and all that it sustained went on and on forever. Always full of life, this life always patterned and orderly and proceeding and progressing according to some mysterious law beyond human comprehension. Thus the universe was populated with a race of giants. Space was inhabited by gods over gods. And all these mysterious sparks in the sky were far more than merely uh, simply uh, radiant centers of some magnetic energy or something of that nature. They were alive, and they shone because the life in them shone through. Perhaps we would interpret this life merely as a fierce combustion, but to these peoples this life was a proof of a great power, a great force. And the light of suns uh, was nothing but the visible nimbus around the heads of invisible gods. All of this made quite a uh, fine and wonderful and dramatic uh, way of looking at things. In the uh, Buddhist uh, Sutra, the Lotus of the True Law, uh, another kind of solar mystery is introduced. Here, the great planetary bodies and even the great cosmic suns in the galaxies 
of the Milky Way or perhaps compounded into the mysterious forms of the zodiacal constellations, all these great sparks of light in the sky were actually temples, shrines, pagodas, mysterious uh, places of worship uh, for great spiritual beings. Every light in the sky was a Buddha in meditation upon the infinite. And when somewhere in the great field of space another living creature being or power attained uh, the infinite illumination, all these mysterious altars and shrines and pagodas in the sky uh, winked and twinkled with approval, and their mysterious powers extending out as spiritual energies uh, became aware of the great cosmic benefaction that this change had wrought when another soul found eternal light. So all these different symbols become quite poetic and in many regards and ways uh, quite inspiring uh, in the development of poetic theory, in the development of religious mystery. All of these different elements go into the general situation and pageantry of things. In the uh, study of this same problem, we then pass on to other considerations. From Paracelsus we learn, for example, that it was the belief of the enlightened of old that every solar system is fashioned in a way like an egg. The Hindus also had the mysterious egg, which was identical with the womb of Miru. Uh, in the solar system, there are actually three centers of power, three suns, uh, from which in the subconsciousness of man came the concept of the Trinity, or the threefold power of God, which was based upon the ancient identification of the sun with deity, an identification that is to be found in every part of the world and in almost every level of human society. Even the most primitive people have been overwhelmed by the majesty of the sun and have come nearly always to attribute the solar propensities to their principal deities. In the uh, Paracelsian corpus, for example, the three suns represent a spiritual center uh, which radiates the life light of God, a psychic center which radiates the life light of love or of the second logos, and a material center from which is generated the physical structure of the solar system itself. Thus it was believed in those days that the visible sun was not the source of life or light. And while it seems to be in a state of vast combustion, as suggested during eclipses when we can see the corona in the form of vast uh, outburstings of flame, running, uh, rising perhaps thousands of miles into space. But to the ancients, this sun, this luminous disk, was actually a reflector of light, not a source of it. Some say, as the Druids did, that it was like the reflecting or uh, refracting lens that brought uh, energy to a focal point, bestowing upon it the power uh, to burn by, con uh, by bringing or converging the rays of light into a small area. In any event, uh, they believe definitely that the true source of all life was in the spiritual sun, invisible, because its life is not such that men can perceive it with any sensory structure which they possess. This spiritual sun imparts its glory to the psychic or soul center of the solar system which may be likened to the second Logos, or the second person of the Neoplatonic Trinity. Uh, this second Logos, or power, in turn transfers its energy, or life, to the third, or material structure, which is therefore ensouled by two invisible sources of life. 
In ancient symbolism, sometimes these three suns were represented as concentric circles, one within the other, or concentric spheres. Under such condition, each of the three moved on a different inclination of axis, and the result was that the complete compound solar body was gyroscopic, capable of suspending itself in the midst of its creation simply by the mysterious equilibrium of the intermotions of its own nature or substance. Uh, this const, uh, concept almost certainly was involved in the Tramuti or the three-headed Brahma in uh, India and probably in the three persons of the triad in Christianity. They did represent in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the three transcendent powers which are together said to be uh, the source of all light or all life in the solar system. Now, we have many ways in which we seek to understand uh, the structure of a solar system. Astronomy has its own ideas, and these ideas may be physically correct and yet in no way exhaust the entire mystery of the matter. The ancients were inclined to feel uh, that a solar system was an allotment in place. That is, somewhere in the great field of life, a solar system had a right to exist, had a right to a place in which it could grow in which it could extend its powers, fulfill its maturity. In other words, like the optimistic human being, the solar system uh, more or less liked to believe that it had a home, a little part of this great space in which all things exist. And like man, the solar system perhaps has only one allotment, the small square of earth in which it will be buried. But in any event, there was this space allotment. And in this space allotment, when the time came, the third Logos, or the third creating power, called by the Gnostics, Ildeboath, uh, the lord of the aeons, was entrusted with the power uh, to bring forth a material world. We know, for example, in the uh, legend of the building of Solomon's temple, the three powers, three master builders, were united in this task. Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and a cunning workman who was brought from Tyre by King Hiram to be the overseer and master of the works, and who was to be the master builder in the perfection of the house of Solomon the king. Uh, these three, later called the three grand masters of Jerusalem, uh, were therefore liked, likened to the three sons in the Kabbalistic mystery. Solomon symbolizing the spiritual son, Hiram of Tyre, the psychic son, which furnished the materials for the temple, and finally Hiram, the son of the widow, the master builder, who was the one to fashion the outer fabric of the house of the living God. So the third Lobos, or creating physical power, uh, invested with authority by the invisible powers behind it, uh, began to make use, as Bemi expresses it, of the allotment, and uh, did so by first of all building around uh, the circumference of the allotment in space, the mysterious wall pass knot, which was the measuring, the surveying of the allotment. William Blake therefore shows deity in the beginning of creation, holding the architect's compass in his hand and drawing a great circle. This great circle became in symbolism the mysterious symbol of the sun itself, a dot in a circle, sometimes represented by the eye of Horus, or an open eye in a circle. But whatever we may want to call it, the first great movement was this tracing of the circle, 
uh, by the compass in the hand of the infinite. And into this allotment set aside uh, by the tracing of the circle, it was said that the uh, great powers began to fashion as within the circular globe of an alchemical vessel the mystery of the solar system. Uh, the uh, solar system, as Plato also points out, begins, therefore, with the circumference and moves gradually toward the center. The wall of the solar system was what the ancient Kabbalists and mystics in the valley of the Euphrates uh, referred to as the wall of heaven. And we find this same thought restored to us in the apocalypse of St. John, and then Mohammed's mysterious night journey to heaven. Also the story of this star descending through the seven gates of the seven worlds in the Babylonian theology. The first and most mysterious power, therefore, of this wall, as St. John points out, is that it divides the universe into or the solar system, more correctly now, into two parts. And this, par this division is suggested in the opening chapters of Genesis. When the waters which were above the heavens were divided from the waters which were beneath the heavens. Uh, outside of the great ring, Ptolemy and the other map makers and geographers of old time assumed there to be only the spiritual universe. This spiritual universe was the abode of the heavenly hosts. Here, somewhere in space, was the eternal throne of God. Here the elders knelt before the throne, and here the Lamb stood as the eternal sacrifice uh, to a world of uh, relapsed lives. St. John, therefore, describes the little ladder that leads up to the wall of heaven, the door that goes through the firmament, into that which is above and beyond. Outside of the ring that was set up uh, in the allotment of space, the heavens themselves were therefore vastly diversified into three great rings, which were called the rings of the constellations. Twelve of these constellations formed the zodiacal band and girdled the globe which was to be the solar system. Twelve other constellations were gathered to the north to form the stars of the northern hemisphere, and twelve others to the south, forming the constellations of the southern hemisphere. These thirty-six constellations, uh, twelve in the, in the middle boundaries, twelve to the north and twelve to the south, made up the thirty-six decans, or divisions of the zodiac in the philosophy of Babylon. This great zodiacal band, therefore, uh, was really uh, the symbol of the sovereign government of that which was above and beyond the solar system. Here the great God sat in endless meditation upon this little bubble and all it, con it contained. Here were the Rishi, the eternal sages, gathering to protect the mysterious power of the magnetic pole. Here was the dragon which Jason sought when he went forth in quest of the magic uh, fleece, uh, the golden fleece. Here also were all the fields of mythology and all the great, strange, and incredible legendary that arose not really from the study of star groups, but from ancient concepts concerning the divine world that rested beyond the, bo the boundary of the solar system. Within this solar system itself, uh, this uh, allotment, this area, began to constrict uh, from the circumference to the center. As it constricted, it left behind it seven conditions of privation, which became to the ancients orbits, or symbols of the pathways of planets. The first and most ancient being or god that was sensed to have been created by this procedure was the deity who uh, ruled over uh, the final extremities of solar existence. This was Cronus, ancient Saturn. He was the first of the gods, the first differentiation within the solar system. 
as the first to come into being, he would be the last to go. And also, in the process of the disintegration of worlds, he would devour all else that came from himself, as Saturn or Cronus is said to have devoured his children. Within the orbit of uh, Cronus was that of Jupiter. For Jupiter overcame his own father and took over the rulership of the solar system. And Jupiter, therefore, became the emblem no longer of despotism, but of a constitutional authority. And in the descent of these orbits, if we want to study it closely enough, we will find also the emergence of all forms of government, because each of these planetary powers ruled at one time in the dawn of things by its own arrangement. Uh, there is a chart in England, an old engraving, showing the solar system of legislation, and it is a very interesting diagram. As Saturn was a strange kind of melancholy despot, ruling by the divine right, so we find in the empire of Cronus uh, this absolute fatality, this, this complete despotism. But with the coming of the empire of Jupiter, who took away the despotism of his father, we find the appearance, as in the Greek and Roman legendary, of a kindlier and more benevolent administration. Jupiter was a monarch, but not a despot. Uh, Jupiter ruled not merely for his own pleasure, but for the benefit of the governed. He became the symbol of justice, whereas Saturn, that had preceded him, was the symbol not of justice, but of tyranny. And gradually in that age, it is said, Jupiter brought forth order, and society was established upon the great foundations of uh, a benevolent uh, leadership. But in the course of time, the Golden Age and all that it implied gradually vanished away. And in the place of the kindly uh, rulership of Jupiter, the uh, solar system passed to the keeping of Mars, or Oz, the god of war. And at some time, remote conflict did arise in the world. And with the conflict of things, uh, there were great changes. Uh, this uh, conflict was partly due to the Promethean episode, in which men gaining a certain fire within themselves, of which Mars is a symbol, uh, suddenly revolted against the gods and set up the tyranny of their own in the world. And in this tyranny they uh, began to struggle one with the other for the advantages of their own causes. And we find in several different mythologies how war and sorrow and misery so increased upon the earth, how men so departed from truth and principle in the ruthless exploitation of their own ambitions that finally the gods sent tempests and deluges and oblivions and combustions and swept away the world that had failed uh, to keep the peace. Out of the reign of uh, Mars then came uh, the peculiar situation that we find in ancient astronomy. For in this arrangement, the sun is placed next in an orbit. So the world passed to the keeping of Helios, the sun god, the Apollo. And in this uh, is implied that the world passed to the keeping of a, of a light, uh, of a refulgence, of a beauty. For with the uh, rising of the solar orbit in the ancient philosophy, the world became inwardly and outwardly illumined. It was then that the visible sun, as we know it in the sky, actually came into existence as a condition or a quality of light. Then it was also that its great symbol, the light of mind, or the light of reason, came. Then it was that man was some way strangely divided from his pre-Adamite kind. 
It was then that some mysterious creature which had this humanity always locked within it suddenly revealed something of its human estate. The eyes of the mind were opened, and the eyes of light began to contemplate a universe by means of the light of intelligence. Then in the course of time, out of this dawning individuality, this rise of the sense of selfness, uh, there came another phenomenon, and that is, was the rulership passed to the next orbit, uh, that of Venus. And in the orbit of Venus, we have the world's tremendous uh, unfoldment, first in the emotional pressures of life, and secondly in the flowering of great arts, uh, the arriving of beauty as a force or power in the imagination of creation. This, uh, thus, uh, artistry, creative self-expression, the urge to reveal or release the soul, through advancements of all kinds of creativity uh, emerged. And there was a second cycle of war, for in this case, um, Athena, which is closely related to this pattern, is accredited with having given to the world ornament and the art of weaving, two widely diversified things. Also in this came uh, the, the, the mysteries of ambition and the strange psychic passions uh, and animal instincts which have later come to be so powerful. After this, the next orbit of the planets arrived in its proper and due sequence, and we had the orbit of Mercury, and the world was turned over to the rule of the intellect. Here, mind began to take over all other considerations. The light of reason passed into darkness, and in its place was the dim candle flicker of thought, of intelligence as we know it. Everything then became a matter of formulas, of terms and words. With the coming of the orbit of Mercury, Cadmus is said to have invented the alphabets and all the writings and readings of mankind. The sciences came into being, and all other forms of exact knowledge. And Mercury became the symbol of formal education, the rise of philosophic systems. Uh, the motion of man also gradually and inevitably towards the sciences. In the ancient concepts of things, the next orbit was given to the, uh, to the moon. And the moon was held as having a true orbit, which we do not recognize today. But in the old geocentric system, the reason for the moon, uh, moon's place is very obvious and important. The moon became the symbol of illusion and delusion. It also became an emblem of self-deceit. Perhaps, however, more originally, uh, and in line with the older concepts of things, the moon was associated with the power of precipitating lives from an invisible to a visible state. The moon, therefore, was the gateway of generations. Uh, the moon provided the mysterious, humid element by means of which souls in a free state were drawn toward body. And it was because of the power of the moon and the mysterious cycles which it exercises, and its still recognized uh, influence on the cycles of fecundity, that the moon is said to have provided the gateway for invisible souls to enter into the earth. Therefore, in that time and under those conditions, uh, not only did the embodiments come, but the embodied creatures ruled by the moon were ruled by a reflected light and not a true light. And the government of the moon was strangely the government of physical instinct based upon the procreative pressure in living things. All of these together, uh, together the seven, then caused their energies and powers to center upon the common receptacle of such energies and powers, and that was the earth. 
And because men thought in terms of their own habitation and of the effect of all these mysteries upon themselves, having no way to interpret except to interpret uh, as these various influences affected their own existence, we know that man psychologically can only live in a geocentric system of existence, or perhaps we might call it an egocentric or a human-centered system because this is all he knows. This is the only experience which he is capable of having. In any event, into the uh, cup, the open cup of the earth, poured all these influences. And these influences not only sent their rays and forces downward, but each ray carried a seed power within itself. And all the planets of the solar system above were reflected under the surface of the earth to become orders of minerals, orders of gems, orders of energy and magnetism, orders of substances and chemicals. They also gradually sprang out of the earth again as orders of plants and animals and living creatures. And everywhere within creatures, these seven again repeated themselves in the rising of sensory perceptions, in the release of powers, in the building of organisms, each, which, each of which was a septenary structure in itself. And from this we have the whole great pattern of septenaries, uh, which due to the divisions within them also provided the law of octaves. Actually having thus brought everything to bear, into the great center of things, we find, as Empedocles points out, that actually in the last we have man. Man himself in whom the universe and the solar system are epitomized. Man who has received his body from the planets, his soul from the stars. We have man himself uh, in whose nature all of these forces are symbolically or actually present. We find man who's suffering from the disease of one planet is cured by the remedy provided by a planet of contrary quality. Here we find also that the sensory perceptions are tied to the stars, the fates of men, to the motions of heavenly bodies. Thus this whole strange, wonderful system seemed to come into existence. And in so doing, it established also the, the relations of worship. It showed the structures of religions, how the faiths of men were engendered and sustained. For each planet set up its own religion in its own time in the cycles of the world. Some of these religions have continued, others have vanished away, but where they have vanished in form, their energies have continued in new appearances. We have in all of these different patterns the endless operation of a law of similars, of all things sympathetically affecting other things of the same qualities, all things uh, by their natures and forms based upon one great design the platonic archetype that was so well sensed and appreciated by Leonardo da Vinci. Architecture, all the different branches of human life, arise of specializations within these areas. From these same planets and their mysteries, the Hindus developed his doctrine of chakras and spiritual centers, came to find the keys to his great systems of yoga and Vedanta, from the same systems also came all the elaborate imagery of Tibet, and Mongolia, and Korea, and China, and Japan. All these patterns work together, forming out of the solar system one design, infinitely repeating itself, repeating itself in gradually descending magnitudes, but always consistent by what the ancients called a process of concatenation, in which things descend in likeness from themselves, decreasing in size, perhaps increasing in number, but always the mystery of one, if solved, will reveal all the others. Also by this same law of mysteries, only one life is carried throughout this entire structure. And were the smallest atom 
or the tiniest structure in nature to actually cease, then the entire universe uh, would fail on its foundation. And uh, this uh, ancient concept seems to have a, have a little bearing on our modern researches in nuclear fission. Uh, nuclear fission is only a manifestation of the incredible energy potential that is locked within the smallest divisions or units of substance. Uh, this reveals perhaps more rapidly and clearly than any other way that the entire energy of space is captured in each of the seeds which are sown in space. And that the reason why the fission of the atom is possible is because all growth is finally a fission of atoms. It is a gradual release of cosmic energy until the smallest, by normal and legitimate growth, unfolding all of its potentials far beyond anything conceivable in a nuclear fission today, that each seed contains within itself the potential of a total cosmos. Uh, this uh, would be quite consistent with the old position and may yet have some fascination for modern thinkers. As the universe and the solar systems that make it up moves in its endless march across the great fields of space. Uh, another interesting point is presented, namely that growth has to be according to this ladder of John or this ladder of Muhammad. Evolution is the motion again uh, from the center to the circumference. When all the great energies in the field set aside for the solar system were condensed, drawn together, or centered in the form of the physical sun. This sun became a vast uh, compression of the energy that had otherwise been diversified over a large area. The moment this compression was uh, perfected or completed, the visible or luminous body of the sun appeared. But from that moment on, Whenever, when involution or the compression process moving toward the center uh, it was changed to the great evolutionary cycle, at that moment the sun's rays began to move out again over the area which had previously been deprived. So that the release of the sun back again to the original state of diffused, equally distributed energy is part of the reason for this great radiance uh, that we ascribe to the solar activity. In other words, the sun moving back over the area which has been deprived is bringing to life or nourishing all these units which have to slumber or rest until the sun's energy is reversed by the great tide of cosmic process. The ancients thought this all out. Perhaps they were ambitious, perhaps they were audacious. But in any event, they had a big idea. They had an idea that uh, certainly transcends our common interpretation of things. In the development of this same concept, the sun became more and more identified with the essential characteristics of man himself. Uh, just as the solar system had its sun, so every man must have his sun, must have his light. And one of the three great centers in man must correspond to this light. In the old system, uh, the analogies were variously made according to the abilities of the people. Uh, the three suns in the human body were represented by the three principal centers in man the heart, the mind, and the reproductive focus. Uh, the third or visible sun was associated with the reproductive system. The second or psychic sun was associated with the brain. And the great central sun, the spiritual sun, was associated with the heart. Uh, the heart was therefore the true giver of life and sustained the other two suns by its own spiritual energy. 
Some of the alchemists had another arrangement, however, in which they showed the heart as a triple sun, much following the Gnostic and earlier beliefs, making the heart again a kind of gyroscopic center in which the three suns had their uh, actual abode, and the uh, mental uh, focus in the brain and the physical focus in the reproductive system were reflexes of this central sun. Uh, this returns also in your northern Buddhistic school where the spiritual sun, Amida, is represented by the two reflexes uh, which are essential uh, expressions, Kanan and Seishi. One representing the psychic life of the individual and the other representing the generative power indicated by the thunderbolt carried by Seishi. In any event, a triad was set up. And in this triad, one energy within man was divided, as in the solar system, to sustain and nourish three different types of growth or different types of energy. Actually, according to the old Hindus, there is another interesting point, namely that the solar system, with all this elaborate process going on in it, and uh, these processes are innumerable and are not in conflict with each other, that the solar system truly represents a great womb, a great place for the prenatal development of sons. Therefore, that actually, to use an old Hindu statement, only the sun itself is born. The planets are embryos. Uh, these embryos uh, actually signify unborn suns. Therefore, each one of them is attached to the solar center by an invisible magnetic umbilicus, which enters each of the planets itself magnetically at the North Pole and provides the luminance or energy necessary to maintain the planet. Each of the planets, therefore, is in a prenatal state nursed by the sun and will remain in this state until it is born, at which time its magnetic field will reverse in the same way as the circulation of the blood in the embryo. In this also, the uh, fact that the uh, planets are not born is carried on as a thought further into the Hindu cosmogony. Uh, in the magnetic fields of the planets, uh, five magnetic fields are recognized or identified. These magnetic fields surround each one of the planets. But by means of a, a, of a little trick in mathematics, these, math uh, these magnetic fields have been increased in number to seven by dividing two of them in half. That is, in two, into an upper and lower uh, level, as in the case in man of the emotional nature, which is described as the higher and lower emotions, and the mental nature described as the higher and lower mind. But actually this is something of a subterfuge, because the complete septenary is only symbolically implied. In the ancient system, each planet has five magnetic fields. Uh, the sun providing the sixth and seventh, so that uh, actually there are only five uh, separate bodies for planets, magnetic or invisible bodies. And the sixth and seventh bodies have not been individualized, and they remain part of the magnetic field of the sun. It is when the sixth and seventh body have been uh, identified or individualized that the planet is actually born and becomes a sun. Until then, it depends for its life and nutrition upon the solar center. All this is also uh, referred to and discussed in the great uh, symbol systems of antiquity. And for instance, we know that in Buddhism, the five Dhyana Buddhas are recognized, the five great spiritual meditating lords, but the sixth and seventh, though known to exist esoterically, are not listed or are not revealed. 
These represent the two powers of life in an evolving planet that have yet to be individualized from the solar body. Uh, man also has the power of a septenary of sensation, seven senses, but only five of these have been individualized. The other two belonging to the psychic field of the planet itself. Thus everywhere in, in the present state of mankind, all septenaries consist of five operating and two suspended powers. This is because they all go back to the solar system with its five individualized and two unindividualized essences. What is the uh, ultimate power of a solar system uh, to be uh, understood as consisting of? In the ancient times, Plato and many others referred to the solar system as the divine animal. The Chinese have a very uh, good idea of this. The solar system is a being. The solar system is alive. And the solar system is the peculiar deity ruling over everything that exists within it. Therefore, the nature, the basic nature of a religion must be associated to the nature of the creation evolving in a solar system. If we get to other planets, as we may someday, it's not at all impossible. We are going to find, however, uh, that intuitively and psychically we have a chord with all beings on other planets. I think this idea of a malignant uh, race somewhere in space waiting to conquer the earth uh, is uh, in the world of science fiction. Uh, actually, man's sixth and seventh sensory perception must be held in common with the equivalent on all other planets of the solar system. Every planet may develop a kind of life uh, which has sensory manifestations of its own, and they may be entirely different from ours. These uh, beings may have the equivalent of five sensory perceptions. If they are comparatively young, they may not have individualized as many to the same degree that we have. If they are more advanced, they will have individualized them perhaps past anything we have achieved. But these sensory perceptions, such as we call sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell, these perceptions or their equivalents according to the conditions of the different planetary environments, will be developed individually by the creatures inhabiting these. As a result, they may have achieved a great nobility, or they may have failed to achieve a high culture. Perhaps they will not even be visible to us, not having the kind of bodies that we know or can capture in our vibratory uh, uh, sensory perceptions. But the two higher faculties, which all beings within a solar system must possess to complete the septenary, the two higher faculties are still unindividualized. Therefore, they still belong to the solar body. And because they belong to the solar body, they are a reservoir of common insight. And any creature extending its consciousness above the fifth sensory perception will have some common communion with any other creature that does the same thing, because these sensory perceptions are not divided. Therefore, if we wish to assume uh, that the sixth sensory perception is a kind of psychic clairvoyance in qualities. 
extending beyond our present knowledge. Perhaps a conscious apperception or experience of causations. Then any creature that reaches this peculiar degree or level of intuitive insight will share it with all other creatures possessing the same insight. In other words, with any creature that passes beyond the fifth sensory perception. Now, the same thing is true of religions. For actually, religions arise in two ways. In substance and essence, they arise from the solar energy itself. By interpretation, they arise from the individualization of man. And this is a point that has uh, also been confused in Buddhism by non-believers. They do not realize the double causation of things, namely the things arising in their own natures, and these same things taking form and unfolding through the mental limitations of human beings. So in the, in the ascent of religions to a certain degree, through what you might term the nominal religious beliefs of man, you are going to have different faiths. But these different faiths are going to move closer together. But when you get to mysticism, you find that it is a faith in common of all men. And when you get beyond that to the highest levels of esotericism, you find there is no conceivable difference in religious conviction. Thus we have in all these different areas, we have five differentiated elements following the old order of earth, fire, air, water, and ether. We also have five differentiated elements recognized in China. They are slightly different from ours, but constitute the same gamut. Then we have two unrecognized basic elements. And these two also constitute, finally, the highest uh, environmental factors holding forms, bodies, and structures together. They are the great cohesives. We have five recognized ether factors, so-called hypothetical but actually real. We also have two higher forms of etheric integrations, which bind things together rather than binding together the parts of single things. Thus, in the solar system, we have a, a very elaborate and very uh, useful purpose uh, in the unfoldment and perfection of life. It has been noted from the beginning also that the processions of planets, the motions of seasons, and all the other uh, phenomena that we know have together constituted religious ritual. We know that the high mass is a solar ritual. We know that practically every part of the religious symbolism of mankind relates to the parts of the solar system and their rhythms and relations with each other. It was uh, only in comparatively short, uh, a short time ago, however, a few centuries, that Kepler made one of his most vital discoveries. The solar system, being like an alchemical retort, containing within itself the power of the sun, which has only the, the power to manifest certain principles from within itself, gradually becomes the environment of an infinite diversity. Uh, the Pythagoreans declared that this diversity included, uh, was included within unity, and unity itself was never divided, the unity representing the wall pass knot that completely envelops the solar system as the shell of an egg or as the surface of a bubble. But now comes the problem. How out of the regularity and inevitability of these processes can what we call difference come into existence? Uh, how, for example, to approach it from an Aristotelian point of view, how can that which is the same 
cause difference. And if we wish to point out the religious factor, that which is the same is God. Therefore, how can that which is the same become conditioned? How can deity, for example, produce the state of not deity? How can infinite good, which is deity, uh, produce the phenomena of that which is not good? How can an eternal, benevolent God permit evil? This is, a, uh, this is a, an interesting and very tricky subject. But perhaps, as Kepler points out, the solar system is the secret. For within its processes, we discover the laws by means of which that which is the same can be different. The answer lies, of course, in the motions of planets. Not that the motions of planets constitute in themselves this difference, but by another subtle factor which Pythagoras also pointed out, namely that the power of planets is not in their bodies but in their intervals. That it is the space between them that determines their power, not the bodies themselves. So here we have, for example, seven powers represented in ancient times by the planetary deities. In the uh, astral theology of the ancients, these seven powers were fixed. Uh, they were manifestations of the power of the solar logos. There was nothing that they possessed that was different from what he possessed. He was not deficient in anything that they could contribute. They remained as they were, each a manifestation of one phase of the divine nature. None could be better or worse than their natural endowment. None could be more or less than that which was their own nature. Therefore, even though they moved and fluttered in space or went whirling around their orbits forever, they could cause, by the more common thinking, no difference. Because it made no difference uh, how they moved or where they moved, their natures did not change. And if their natures did not change, then in the common thinking of man, there could be no difference or separateness set up by them. But what happened, as Kepler found, was the things, the natures of which do not change, produce difference by their relationships with each other. The things themselves do not change, but the angles of incidence of energy motion and the directions of motions do change. Therefore, if, these, uh, if two of these bodies uh, came into a relationship of a 90 degree angle of the meeting of their rays. This relationship was different in quality from a conjunction of these two bodies or an opposition of these two bodies in which their rays met at an angle of 180 degrees, which was merely to oppose one with the other. Consequently, all relationships were due uh, to these movements of similars, in which things never changing of their own nature create immutable and inevitable change by their relationship. Uh, a very simple example of that, which we all can recognize, is the fact that the seasonal changes of the earth, winter, spring, summer, and fall, do not mean that there is any change actually in the structure of the sun or in the structure of the earth, nor is there any essential difference in the amount of energy which the sun bestows. But the angle of incidence of the rays of the sun striking the earth will produce the differences of season simply because of the inclination of the earth's axis. Yet nothing is substantially changed, only changed by relation of incident. Consequently, the entire universe, solar systems, cosmic systems, space itself, 
is subject to an infinite diversity of manifestation simply due to this relationship of unchanging parts. By this relationship, all things uh, become differentiated. More forms of life become differentiated than it is possible for us to even imagine. Yet this differentiation in itself has no, is no evidence that anything becomes better or worse. It simply represents difference. This led to certain moral speculations concerning existence. And it, uh, po it points out to us very clearly that all natures have within them essentially the same substances. But conditions uh, due to relationships release what appear to be individualities. This again is a good psychological point. For actually, it is relationship, association, and use that determines the development of the differences in human personalities, not a difference in the essential life energy involved. In the uh, Eastern religions and philosophies particularly, uh, the solar system, of course, becomes part of the range of mental phenomena. Uh, this means, uh, however, something which I think we have to bear uh, a little thought for because we are interested in both Eastern and Western philosophy. The idea that some people have uh, that certain Eastern schools simply regard the universe as an illusion, uh, is this attitude is for the most part wrong. The ancients, and particularly the Oriental peoples, did not hold that the solar system had no existence. It did not believe, they did not believe that the cosmic systems had no existence. Nearly all of the Eastern systems arise from the philosophies of India, and these philosophies did not deny uh, physical phenomena. Nor did they say when a man sat down on a chair that neither the man nor the chair could be there. Actually, this was an exaggeration arising in the minds of interpreters um, trying to make an absurdity out of a situation that is basically a rather sound. The Eastern position on the matter is this. You stand at a certain point, we will say, on the earth and you look out into the rest of the solar system and perhaps through and beyond it to the regions of the stars. And you look out and you say to yourself, what do these things mean? How are we to interpret uh, the essential natures of these powers? And Eastern philosophy says that with a very limited area of experience at our disposal that most of this mystery simply cannot be experienced. We can observe it, we can feel it, but we cannot participate in it. We can have a certain pleasant emotional experience of being out under the stars at night and sensing the magnitude of it all, uh, but the solar system, or even the planet itself, cannot be experienced by man. He can only be an observer of it. He can only look at it with wonder and be profoundly uh, influenced in his thinking by the strange regularities which he beholds. But it is because he cannot experience it that he is capable of massing evidence about it into two distinct schools. He is able to mass one group of evidence on the level of material science and insist that all he is looking at is a vast machine. He is able to gather evidence or amass conviction on another side of the question in which he is convinced 
that the entire mystery of solar existence is held in the hand of an eternal God. He can see these things as physical processes if he is a physical thinker, psychic processes if he is a psychologist, philosophical processes if he is a philosopher, divine processes if he is a theist. Each one in his own level interprets, but he is interpreting from his own level of insight. And he has no true evidence, as Buddha points out, that any of these levels of insight is adequate. He has no way of knowing. He is willing to argue to the end of time in the defense of his own position, but he is not sure of any part of it. He is not assured of the faculties or the powers with which he estimates these things. Therefore, it is really uh, practically impossible for him to do more than to present or preserve or transmit the great traditional concepts which have descended to him uh, from his uh, ancestors, from the great schools of the past. Why do we find, in the majority of instances, that these traditional instincts or these traditional attitudes are apparently more idealistic than the more recent ones? Why does it seem as though man is forever declining into materiality? Why is it that the creativity of his race, the creativity of his culture, is always remote? And in uh, the course of history, it would seem that he is forever losing ground. The answer to this probably lies in the fact that the differentiation of human sensory perceptions, the rise of the five senses sustained by their etheric elemental counterparts, as these have grown more and more powerful, they have led to greater and greater individualization. The five senses have blocked out the superior sensory perceptions. They have obscured them. Uh, as the Tibetan says, the eye of the sage has been closed, and in its place are the two eyes that see the world. In the ancient uh, philosophies, uh, the mysterious spiritual eyes in the brain were believed to be active, which is no longer the case. In the development of the relationship between man and his planet, and man's growth on the planet, and his gradual adjustment to the external environment of the planet, from all these we see that man, indoctrinated through his sensory perception, has become more and more aware of physical things, and less and less aware of their causes. He has also gradually become less interested in causes, simply because he senses the frustration of trying to find them. Somewhere along the line, probably everyone makes two or three stabs in the dark towards some more enlightened point of view, but finding nothing but resistance or a, a static a non-reaction from space around him, he retires finally uh, to lick his wounds and remain in his materialistic concepts. But in the remote time of things, man moved from an internal uh, to an external state. And this also is related to the development of the planet. According to the ancient tradition, the planet developed like the fertilized cell of the human being by developing a polar cap or a gradual descent of crystallization from the north polar extremity of the cell. Uh, this crystallization resulted in the emergence of what the ancients called the imperishable land or the imperishable island. And gradually the development of this uh, planetary form uh, made it increasingly suitable for the embodiment 
of beings or entities that had previously been suspended in the seven orbits or seven conditions of the invisible body of the earth. The earth entity taking form, kept coming into manifestation within the solar system, as the earth entity unfolded, the lives which it carried with it uh, began to unfold also, as in the case of the embryo, where the embryo, having once begun to manifest, seems to bring into manifestation an ever greater number of cellular lives and structures uh, to become its new body. Uh, the uh, earth, according to the ancients, as it unfolded, caused these various orders of life to come into embodiment or come into incarnation. And because five have been individualized, five have come into life. And this is what we see in our experiences today. Actually, beyond this point, uh, the evolution of these different forms of life reveal different degrees, we will say, of superior insight. From the early, in the earliest days, these forms coming into manifestation still shared a degree of the sixth and seventh power in common, or the solar intuitive insight. These beings were aware of the archetype, and they imprinted this archetype on their most primitive institutions. They first intuitively and instinctively and probably without conscious intent simply lived according to the archetype. As the patterns of the archetype grew dimmer within themselves, they then had dependence upon the forms which they had already built as though at some very remote time they had fashioned a beautiful vessel of clay, simply because they had a tremendous insight into beauty. Gradually this insight faded away, but the vessel of clay remained, and they were able to copy it indefinitely from that time on, making an, a vast number of reproductions of it. These reproductions, however, drifted further and further away from the original design because they had lost consciousness of the original design and were merely reproducing something that had already existed. Man becoming more and more absorbed in material forms follows this process of infinitely reproducing old concepts but having lost the meaning of them. Thus we have an age of fable that descends to us, with the legends preserved and the meanings lost. Thus we have uh, great archetypal arts, which were originally vast spiritual sciences, but now they have descended to us merely as physical arts and sciences with their true meanings lost. In the background of all knowledge, therefore, is this lostness which results from embodiment. And this lostness is the result of involution, or the descent of life into form. The regaining of the lost insight is evolution, or the rescuing of consciousness through form. The belief of the ancients was that solar systems come into existence and go out of existence like any other type of body in space. Uh, just as surely as the human being completing a life cycle retires from visibility only to remain for a time in abscondito and then to come forth again in a new body. So solar systems likewise go to sleep, carrying with them their natural karma, which they have on their own level of function. After a certain time, the solar system is born again in the same way that we described at the beginning of the talk. It receives its allotment and emerges. In the meantime, it remains in suspension, in seed form, uh, through the nights of the solar rest, the great trilaya between embodiments. This brings, to another, uh, brings up another interesting point, and that is that while these various degrees of life 
are locked in their potential seed forms, represented in Buddhism by placing a luminous pearl upon a lotus flower, and then placing in the pearl a character of the Sanskrit language. This is called the seed form. It is the vibration pattern, by means of which the power will be caused to emerge from sleep. When the uh, time comes for this seed to open, it becomes then obvious that all the different kinds of seeds floating in space appear the same while they are in seed form. But when they begin to awaken, they all awaken according to the inherent degree of their previous existence. Consequently, while lives may not appear to differ at some stage in their growth, as it is true that in the early degrees of fetal development it is almost impossible to tell the human uh, fetus from that of a chicken or some quadruped. After a certain time, however, uh, the differentiating characteristics appear. After a certain time, the chicken comes out of the shell, but the human fetus remains much longer to gain greater evolutionary prenatal growth. Thus in space, all of these different levels exist, levels of growth. Some forms can never unfold at this time or in this degree of their life beyond an atomic pattern. Others can develop into cellular forms. Some can develop into complicated cellular structures like the radiolaria. Some have a more potential and will become animate things. These in turn divide into all kinds of kingdoms, species, and genera. Finally, some of these, which could not be distinguished from the others at the beginning, become human. Then there are other seeds in this space which uh, evolve without our ever knowing uh, what the final pattern may be. There are seeds that are growing now that will not reach their maturity until after man has ceased to be on the earth. There are also seeds of other substances, and science is beginning to suspect this, which are growing invisibly around us all the time and are actually creating worlds just as well integrated and organized as our own, but entirely beyond our perception. Thus it is perfectly possible for many different patterns to grow up in space, uh, this, this growth always being the unfoldment of the potential that is carried in the seeds. The sun, of course, is an example of such a seed. A planet is also an example of such a seed, and so is man. And each one of these seeds will continue to grow, and through the association of karma, uh, will gradually unfold greater and greater potentials. But the transference from one kingdom to another, or a major step forward, will only take place during the period of rest, or the pralaya between creations. At the moment, one of our greatest and most interesting subjects is the study of the moon. Represented in ancient art as, they say, the mad mother of the earth. Uh, the actual relationship of the moon to the earth in the Eastern philosophy is that it is the previous body of the earth entity. The moon is therefore a corpse. The moon is a body disintegrating in space. And the life wave that belonged to it and once needed it has evolved to become the earth humanity. The moon, therefore, is a shell, a ghost, uh, like one of the uh, doppelgangers of ancient Teutonic legendary and law. This does not mean that the moon is totally dead any more than a corpse is totally dead. It does mean, however, that the type of life uh, in the corpse or in the moon is residual. It is that 
uh, which belongs to the smaller organisms or parts from which the major life-giving principle has been removed. The decay of a dead body is an evidence of life, but it is a gradual release of living things from a pattern, and because they are released from the pattern, uh, they gradually become destroyed by lack of the central nutritional power which holds things together. So the moon has its own sub-life, but it does not possess uh, a major uh, evolving life such as we know. Uh, while uh, we are discovering its craters and its well-popped surface, uh, actually, we have learned nothing from this uh, recent exploration of the subject that was not philosophically known thousands of years ago. And except for a few completely um, fictional approaches, uh, no one of serious mind and philosophy has had any idea other than that of the ancient Hindus that the moon was gradually disintegrating. It was like a ghost in a graveyard. It was uh, perhaps a little more tangible or physical than the common ghost that we see, but still it is only a shadow. It is only a remainder, which can never again be re any more than the mummified body of an Egyptian pharaoh. The energies of the moon, however, are very interesting. Because man, in his own psychic integration, also has a lunar antibody in his own magnetic field. The moon plays a part in the life of things. It isn't a total loss by any means. Uh, the moon radiates certain kinds of energy. Uh, the energy of the sun striking the moon and reflected to the earth mingles in psychic chemistry with the direct ray of the sun, forming a peculiar chemical situation on the earth itself. Also, the etheric double of the moon, which is only a phase of its physical body, and like the spook, is also an empty shell. The etheric double of the moon is very important in connection with physical generation. It provides certain elements necessary for the creation of bodies. Uh, these elements being particularly the etheric field, which holds particles of matter together, and also provides the link binding consciousness to form. The moon plays an important uh, relation part in these things. The moon also, because of its tremendous influence upon tidal motions and upon the fluids of things, is the most dominant factor in the etheric body of the earth. It is this, uh, the lunar motions, working through the etheric field that disturb substances in the magnetic field of man, producing certain phenomena which is intensified at eclipses and at new moons, also producing a kind of phenomena uh, that by disturbing the etheric fluid balance of the human body is associated with outbreaks of mental uh, disease. It is deeply involved in the problem of contagion and infection which are themselves due to the debilities of the etheric double. And, of course, we know that the moon is, in, is involved in the menstruational cycle. These all have to do uh, with the effect upon the etheric double of man, which is the problem involved, because the moon determines uh, the day and night of ether, of the etheric double, as the sun determines the day and night of the physical body. Therefore, it is the moon that determines uh, the, uh, the cycles of fertility and sterility, 
in the life of all creatures on the earth. The moon also has to do with the psychic field of man in its effect upon imagination. And the imaginative faculties of the mind are to a degree due to the uh, influence of the moon upon the etheric fluids that support both the brain and the mind. Therefore, actually, uh, the effect of the moon is that of push and pull, a gravitational effect creating an imbalance in the magnetic field. Each planet has moons. Some have more than one. In some, however, the moons have disintegrated until only the etheric doubles uh, still exist. Uh, when a moon is completely removed, or when a planet loses the last of its moons, and there is no further uh, disturbance of this kind, it means that almost certainly uh, that that particular planet has outgrown its etheric, etheric inconstancy. Where the moons disappear, the duration of the physical life upon a planet is greater. When the moons disappear, most of the tensions and psychic pressures of a planet are reduced. And uh, if we are to assume that somewhere uh, there is a place where things are immortal, it must be where the power of the moon has been done away with, because the moon is associated closely with mortality. There's one other point we'd like to mention, and that is the rings of Saturn. These were known at a very early time in human experience. The rings of Saturn represent a link between the solar system and that which lies outside of the globe or area set aside for the manifestation of the solar logos. Uh, the, the planet Saturn is a chemically psychic thing which suggests almost nirvana. For the rings are really, according to the ancients, were the bands of ever more subtle vibrations through which entities or beings pass when they escape from the solar system. Therefore, the rings absorb all of the forms of life in the orbits of the other planets, and that which is useless is cast into chaos by the rings of Saturn, and that uh, which has the great spiritual power, or that which has the great evolutionary trend perfected within it, is released through the rings of Saturn into a developed consciousness beyond that uh, which we know here. Therefore, the rings of Saturn bring the solar system into objectivity and reabsorb it again into subjectivity. Uh, when Saturn eats all his children, the elements of the solar system, the assimilation and excretion of this procedure is through the rings. And most ancient peoples were, were very much aware that the, uh, the rings represented the final breakdown of all things that have to do with mortality, and that the final vestiges of matter are broken up and scattered in space through the rings of Saturn. These rings also form the link between this solar system and the next superior order of life. So with uh, thousands of years of thought and study and a vast amount of interpretation of these matters, the ancients came to some interesting thoughts on this subject, thoughts that can also be adapted to other areas of interest. And while we might not uh, really feel that uh, their position uh, was entirely sound astronomically, let us realize that this wasn't their problem. Their primary problem was the psychology of the universe. Their primary, primary problem was the relationship between creation and mental phenomena. And most of all, the relationship 
as experienced in the consciousness of man between the human being and the vast evolving patterns of space. Thus, while geocentric astronomy is no longer regarded as accurate astronomically and physically, there is much to indicate that geocentric astronomy is very accurate psychologically because it deals primarily with levels of qualities, with processes taking place in the invisible psychic uh, structure of things, and not merely uh, the physical processes with which uh, we are acquainted. The physical processes of generation and uh, corruption of life, which we see, is only one aspect, for while this is taking place, while man seems to be going down to the grave, man and the universe are moving upward toward another destiny. And in uh, one level, uh, the energies seem to be classified in a physical pattern, but in the great level of things, the psychological pattern seems to be archetypally similar to the old, arbitrary, psychically revealed structure of the universe. And it is in this older structure that we must uh, seek man's original insight and try to understand how his psychic nature is best represented by one pattern, even though this pattern is inconsistent with known uh, physical scientific formulas. If we can combine these different elements, I think we will gain something of interest. Well, I guess time is up, so we'll see you next week. Continue with this arbitrary rambling. <laughs>